You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. Today's episode is brought to you by GetOutOfTheMess.com. Let Asha, your Legal Shield associate, connect you to a legal insurance plan that's right for you. Quality attorneys at established law firms for about $20 a month. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old, rehashed, personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to, think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Hello, this is Paul Coliani, personal empowerment coach and host of The Overwhelmed Brain. This is the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On every episode, we'll talk about practical down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. I want to help you bridge the gap between your emotions and reason, causing you to discover why you do the things you do and what you can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. Everything I talk about in this show should not be mistaken for actual medical advice or treatment and is intended to be for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your medical treatment. Yeah, I'm getting better at that. What you will find here is an increase in your emotional intelligence, a strengthening of your self-worth and self-esteem, the motivation to be your authentic self, and the forward momentum to help you learn, heal, grow, and evolve. All right. One of the first things I want to talk about today has to do with wanting someone that doesn't want you. I think we've all been there. (laughs) I know I've been there. I've wanted someone who didn't want me, yet I pursued them anyway. Not only would I pursue them, I might even beg them to be with me. So let me share with you my take on wanting someone who doesn't want you. Or maybe I could put it, who doesn't necessarily want you. Or is debating on whether they want you or not. Whatever it is. Let's go on the premise that you want someone that doesn't want you. Or you have in the past or something like that. The way I see it is that when you want someone who doesn't want you. And especially if you, you know, beg for them to be with you. That's not love. That is infatuation. Or it's fear fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, fear of not feeling significant, not important, something like that. There's some sort of fear there. So when you want someone and you are continually pleading with them or asking them to want you or be with you, and you're even saying, I love you so much, please come back to me, and they don't want to, that's not love. That's infatuation or fear. There may be more to that. Uh, If you think of something else that it could be, let me know. But that might be the most major components of what happens when uh, you are seeking a relationship with someone who doesn't want a relationship with you. Now, what happens when someone that you want ends up with someone else and you're upset by that? Now, I'm talking about someone that you're not currently in a relationship with. To them... That's not you loving them. To them, that is you being infatuated or in fear. I know it can feel like you love them. I love you so much. Come back to me. But if you define love the way I do, which you may not, I define love as supporting the other person's happiness. And sometimes that happiness doesn't include you. It took me 44 years to figure that out. That really, truly loving someone means supporting what they want for themselves. And sometimes that includes you and sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't mean you can totally be freely happy for them. I know that's hard to do. But it does mean that you love them when they choose the path they want to choose for themselves. So this is why I'm saying that when you want someone that doesn't want you and ends up with someone else, loving them means supporting that path. That doesn't mean you're happy about it. Doesn't mean you like it. It just means that you are supporting their happiness. And when they feel that from you, 
they're going to recognize that as love. But if they feel a desperation from you, if they see you going, please don't be with that person, come back to me, give me another chance, that comes from a place of fear. You can even hear it in my voice. I mean, I've used this inflection in my life. I've used this at times in my life saying, please don't do this to us. Don't do this. Don't go in that direction. Go, don't go with that person. Don't, you know, whatever. Come back to me. You can hear it in my voice when I just role play that. That's coming out of fear. It's coming out of desperation. So that's important to know. And this is what is sensed from the other side. If you've ever been on that side of the fence where someone wants you in their life and you don't want them, you can hear it from them. And you can sense that it's not love. You may think it's love. They may think it's love. But it's not. It's a, it's a fear. Don't leave me alone. What am I going to do in my life without you? You're the one who has to fill this gap that I have missing in my life. This is what they might be going through in themselves, but not necessarily thinking. And that's what I went through. I would look at someone that I wanted back in my life, for example. You know, we break up and I didn't want the breakup. And then I see her having a good time without me. And I just want her back. Come back to me. Make me feel better. Make me happy. Now, I'm not talking about in love. I'm talking about love. When you love someone and you support their happiness, you support their path. Again, this is my definition. You may not agree with it, but my definition of love is supporting that person's happiness and wanting the best for them. Now, you may think I'm the best for them, <laughs> but you have to support their decisions and their choices in what's best for them. They may make a mistake and find someone that's worse than you or something. And if that's the case, they need to go through that experience to understand what they are losing. But they need to have it. It can't be pushed on them. It can't be shoved into their face. They need to have the experience in order to understand what's good and bad in their life, what's nice to have and what's not nice to have, and just figure out where they need to go in life. This is what they need to do for themselves. There's nothing we can do to convince them when they don't want us. So when it comes to love and in love, now, when you love someone, you know my definition for that. When you're in love with someone, you combine the supporting that person's happiness with how you feel inside for them. So now this is where you might get locked into, I want you back so bad. And I love the feeling in me when you're in my life. That in love feeling. I love the feeling in me when you're in my life. I love feeling joy, romantic, intimate, sexual. I love feeling all these things. And the reason I feel those things, I can attribute to you. I am in love with you. And I love you. I think that's a great distinction. This is a personal opinion. <laughs> this is not based on scientific fact, just personal experience and me kind of studying this subject in me and others in my own life and their life and trying to figure out exactly where to draw the line of loving someone and being in love with someone. In love is a very personal experience, how I feel, how you feel when that person's in your life. And loving them is that uh, external, I support you in your path. When they come together and that person loves you, supports your path, and they're in love with you and they have these great feelings inside of them and they like these feelings and they want more of those feelings, then typically a relationship will work out great. When it's all reciprocal like that, it'll work out great. It doesn't tend to work out when uh, one person is in love and the other person isn't. My first long-term relationship is a great example of this. And uh, I think I'm going to use this relationship as an example in another segment that I'm going to do in this show. I, I'm just kind of thinking out loud. <laughs> Last two years of my first long-term relationship, uh, it was around two years, I guess, she fell out of love with me. But she still loved me. And I could tell that was the truth. Because she didn't want to hurt my feelings by leaving the relationship. It was very fragile <laughs> back then. And um, my feelings were 
I want you to want me, even if you don't want me. That was a little destructive. I mean, I look at it now. I, I didn't know I felt that way then, but that's what was happening. Is that I wanted her to want me, even if she didn't want me. And I wanted to stay in the relationship, even if she didn't want me. And looking back, I can remember that she absolutely loved me, supported my path, wanted me to be happy, but was definitely not in love with me. So she didn't want me and I wanted her. This doesn't work. This is what uh, creates a rift in the relationship when one of you is not in love. I mean, that's obvious, right? One of you is not in love. It's not going to work out. The topic I'm talking about in this segment is when you pursue a relationship with someone who doesn't want you. And how I'm saying that it's pretty much uh, a bad idea and pretty much a waste of time normally. I'm sure there are instances where this has worked. But if you have to convince someone to want you, then how is that a good solid foundation for a relationship to begin? It's kind of where I'm going with that. Now let me take a little different angle on this. When someone that you want doesn't want you, they're basing that decision on who you've been, not who you'll be. Now, a good example of this is in a business environment. When I got promoted to assistant manager at a company that I worked for in the 90s, it was because I was already functioning and showing up as an assistant manager. It wasn't because I had potential to be an assistant manager. That's an important distinction. Are you showing up to elevate your relationship to another level, to a a promotion, if you will, a relationship promotion? Are you showing up to be a better person in the next stage of your relationship? Is the relationship improving to be a good, healthier, more nurturing, more supportive relationship in the relationship's future? Kind of an odd question to ask, but it's something to think about. Is your partner showing up in a way that elevates them and elevates the relationship and even elevates you? Are all of the components of the relationship preparing for the next stage in its evolution? Just like I was already functioning as an assistant manager before I was promoted to assistant manager. I was already there. I was already doing that job. Purposefully, I was outgrowing my old position and working harder, smarter, more efficiently, doing everything that the assistant manager would do. And suddenly I just slipped into that role. I love looking at relationships like this too. Acting as if there are functions of the relationship that I need to perform in order for the relationship to get to the next level. And hopefully my partner in life will do the same thing. My girlfriend is always doing the best she can, working on herself, discussing the hard topics with me, uh, talking about hard subjects with me, working on having date nights, you know, doing all these little routines and other things to improve what we have today. Because there's a big difference if I showed up at home drinking beer, watching TV, And being lazy, I'm not saying anything's wrong with any of these, (laughs) but if that was my uh, pattern most of the time, then what I'm doing is working my way to a demotion. (laughs) I'm working my way into a uh, getting fired (laughs) or getting uh, kicked out in in the relationship. I would use different terms, getting broke up with, (laughs) getting kicked out might be something that happens too. (laughs) getting to the point where she doesn't love me anymore or is not in love with me anymore because it's hard to support someone who is not in it to progress the relationship. And I think that's an important point is that when you are in a relationship with someone, are you both doing things to progress the relationship? And if you are, when that happens, you usually go through ups and downs but there's more ups than downs. When you're not doing that, there's usually more downs than ups. And that's a great gauge. If there's more ups than just like that um, graph in a stockholders meeting <laughs> that shows 
the line going uh, a little up, a little up, then down, then a little up, a little up, then down, you can tell there's a trend. And the trend has good momentum. It's always going in a positive direction. If your relationship doesn't have that kind of trend, then one of these components might be missing. You love them. You support their happiness. They love you. They support your happiness. You're in love with them. You have good feelings when they're they're in your life. They're in love with you. They have good feelings when you're in their life. Of all four of those components, maybe one of them is off. Maybe one of them doesn't work the way it should. Maybe you think or they think that love means something else. And it might be important to define those things, define love and in love in your relationship so that you know the direction you need to take. Because when you have that kind of information, then you can both work on the relationship. You work on yourselves, you bring the best version of yourself into the relationship, and then you work on the relationship, and you try to create the best relationship possible, and you try not to get into a stagnation, which is hard. I'm going to say it right now. Being in a relationship and not being stagnant can be a hard thing to do. You go to work every day. If you have kids, you have to take care of the kids. If you have responsibilities, if you have another job because you have so many financial issues, I mean, all of these things can wear you down and it's really hard to put any time and energy towards someone else. But you still have those four components. You love, you in love, they love, they in love. You loving them and you're in love with them, them loving you and them in love with you. When you have those four components, even with that stagnation, and even if that line on the whiteboard is flat, you know, that trend I was talking about, a progressive, uh, nurturing, relationships getting better all the time, line goes up and to the right and keeps, uh, goes down and then up again and then down and then up, 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 and then down and then up, up. That trend is nice to have, Sometimes it's hard to get when there's so many other obligations and responsibilities. But if you took away all the obligations, all the responsibilities, and just ask yourself, am I still in love and do I love this person? And they ask themselves the same thing and you get a yes answer to those questions, then even with all those obligations and responsibilities, uh, you know that's still the foundation. The foundation is important. If you don't have that foundation, it's a lot harder. So I want you to ready yourself for the next level of your relationship all the time. Even if you think that everything is perfect in your relationship, there's still a maintaining phase. It's like someone starting a company and being the sole owner and proprietor and president and CEO and CFO of his or her own company. They're at the top, but there's a lot of maintaining to do to keep it going and keep it flowing in the right direction uh, so that it is a positive trend always moving forward. There are going to be ups and downs, yes. But what is the trend overall? What's the trend overall in a month, a year, five years, ten years? Is it always doing better or at least gaining some sense of momentum, some sense of traction? You and your partner are the presidents of your relationship like the top tier, (laughs) you are working towards the best your relationship can get all the time. Because when you're not, and one of you starts to um, fall back a little bit, the company slash relationship suffers. This happens in business partnerships too. One partner starts to slack off, stops making cold calls, starts using the money on things that don't benefit the company and starts causing issues. It, the company suffers as a whole. So if one of you is in some way bringing chaos or disorganization or showing up in a way that's not beneficial to the relationship, that's when the relationship can go downhill. So don't work your way out of the relationship. Work your way into the next level. Work yourself. Your partner works themselves and you work on the relationship together to bring it to that next stage, whatever that is. Even if you don't know what it is, even if you don't know how you're going to get there, it's always a process of uh, improvement of some sort. And if you're listening to the show, you're probably already on that path. 
<laughs> or at least you're hoping your partner will tune in one day. <laughs> if that's the case, I hope so too. But if not, then just consider this uh, your me time, <laughs> your time to connect with yourself for a balancing in your life. Anyway, that's it for this segment. We'll be right back after this. if you've been listening for a while, you know that I like to uh, support Asha over at Get Out of the Mess because she supports this show and she supports all the listeners of this show by um, providing access to a service that is very, very helpful. That service is a legal shield. If you go to Asha's website, getoutofthemess.com, there's a couple of videos on there that um, some are testimonials and uh, there's other things on there that tell you what you can use the service for. But let me just tell you in a nutshell, it's probably one of the best things that I've ever done for me personally and for my business as well. What it is, is you pay like, I don't know, personal plan is like $18 and a family plan is like $24. I, I don't know the numbers don't hold me to them, but I think I'm like a dollar or two within range. And um, there's also business plans too, but you pay this monthly fee and I know you're, I know you're thinking monthly fee, no, but I want you to think about this. If you've ever needed legal advice or someone to guide you in the right direction or someone to send a letter on your behalf or even make a phone call, um, and there's all kinds of other services that they do, but if you've ever needed anything like that, or you think you'll need it, I really want you to consider calling Asha. Asha can connect you with Legal Shield. I mean, this is how they operate. Legal Shield has associates uh, connect people with their plan. So the associate can answer questions before someone just signs up for the service. Because Legal Shield wants you to be in the system, of course, but they also want you to get the most out of it. it is it right for you? And that's what Asha answers for you. If you call her at 678 355 8777, just ask her if Legal Shield is right for you. This is for U.S. and Canada residents, so you got to be one of those uh, countries. So give Asha a call at 678-355-8777 or visit her website at getoutofthemess.com for more information. All right, welcome back. This is uh, segment two. I used to call it Ask Paul, but there's so many Ask Paul segments in my show now. <laughs> I'll just call it segment two and see what comes up. Now, I did get an email that I want to read to you. Because uh, this is from someone I'm going to call, I don't know, Mary. Dear Paul, I'm so happy I discovered your podcast. Wow, what a refreshing difference it is to listen to you and be given tools to work with versus sitting on a shrink's couch getting nowhere. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Mary. It's funny, I actually have a lot of people that um, have been to a lot of therapy and they come to me looking for something a little different. So um, I'm not against therapy at all. I think it's very helpful. It, it can change your life. But if you try therapy and you can't get anywhere, then sometimes my show can be helpful. Or at least an addendum, I should say. So I'm glad you found this show, Mary. <laughs> so my issue is that my husband and I haven't had sex in a number of years. Uh, I'm seriously depressed over this, and to make things worse, I feel like it's becoming a huge power play between us. I'm a very attractive woman, but out of resentment of my husband not touching me, I'm eating out of anger. I've gained 45 pounds. He used to nag me constantly about my eating, but I feel like why should he have his trophy wife when he won't even touch me? So I'm angry, bitter, lonely, and I desire him so badly, but my heart hurts over this. I'm stuck because now I'm overweight, and all this has done is make things worse for me, and I can't seem to get motivated to lose the weight. I feel hopeless. Thanks for listening. Okay, thanks, Mary. Thank you for sharing this. Uh, I can relate. So let me start by saying this. This is not about sex or sexual attraction. 
When you have a long-term partner, yes, attraction plays a role, but there's also the 99% of the time that you're together not having sexual (laughs) relations. And hopefully you've heard my podcast several weeks ago that I called uh, Sex Starts Before the Bedroom. If you haven't heard that, you might want to listen to it. It's not really going to help you in your current situation, but it may have been very helpful when the sex uh, stopped for you. So getting an idea of what you could have done when the sex stopped will be helpful, I think, uh, to give you an idea of the type of behavior that leads to uh, attraction and keeps attraction in the relationship. Now, here's the question I have for you. Uh, What was happening when the sex stopped? What do you think caused it to stop? That might be a hard question to answer because if there's any type of uh, built-up resentments that have occurred over the years, that resentment could have come to a head and then just stopped your intimacy. That could have been happening. If there's any lack of uh, expression, like something going on inside of you that you don't want to share because you don't want to upset the other person or they don't want to share because they don't want to upset you, That could lead to um, a lack of intimacy. That could lead to where you are today. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Like I said in the previous segment, I had this uh, long-term girlfriend, and two years before our relationship ended, the sex stopped. It was just over. And uh, every night I would go to bed, and I would just be angry (laughs) because nothing would happen. And I was confused. And she always had a great excuse. So I didn't know what to do with it. I was just kind of lost. I didn't know why it stopped until a decade later when I decided to heal through a lot of stuff that I had going on inside of me. And uh, looking back at that, I remember that I never wanted to show her anything. Now, this is going to sound a little strange at first, but hear me out. I never wanted to show anything but my kind, caring compassionate, loving self. Now, when I say that to you, like, I'm going to show you nothing but my kind, caring, loving, compassionate self. Does that sound like a good thing? And I want you to think about that because I'm going to show you nothing else. Just my kind, caring, compassionate, loving self. Because if that sounds good to you, I want you to imagine what else might be in me that I'm not showing you. Now, for some people, that might be a good thing. Like, I never want to see the angry side of you. I never want to see the frustrated side of you. I never want to see you have an opinion that is strong. (laughs) I never want to see you uh, disagree with me. You know, these might be things that you might think of. Like, oh, it would be great to have someone that's nothing but kind, caring, compassionate, and loving. I would love that. But imagine if I held everything else, all my negativity in what would happen? What part of me would you get? And would you believe that's the real me? That's what happened to me, is that I refused to show my real self out of fear that I'd be yelled at or she'd leave me or kick me out or something. I was always afraid to show any other side of me than that kind, caring, compassionate, loving self. And because of that, she always felt like she didn't know the real me. She always felt like there was a part of me that um, was hidden from her. And I remember her saying one day, do you love me? I thought that was an odd question. I was like, of course I love you. I mean, I love you with all my heart. How much more can I show you love? Of course I do. I thought it was an odd question, but now I see why she asked that. Because who was I? I wasn't my real self around her. I was not authentic. I only showed up the way I wanted her to see me. And this is so vital to understand that we think we're doing our partner a favor by showing them only the part of us that we believe they want to see. When in reality, in most cases, and I'll tell you which cases this doesn't apply, in most cases, they want to see the negative side too. They want to see everything. They want to see the whole thing. They want to know what they're dealing with. It's like laying out everything on the table so that they have something to work with. I love knowing what I have to work with. That's why I would get upset with my girlfriend now. (laughs) 
I used to get upset with her because she would hold a grudge or she would be grumpy for weeks. Sometimes she wouldn't even give me eye contact. And I would have to stop her and go, what is wrong? And she would go, nothing. And I would be like, I know something's wrong because you barely look at me. What is going on? And she would finally say, well, that thing that you said several weeks ago made me upset. And I would say, what thing? What are you talking about? And then she would tell me the story and I would be like, you're still upset over that? Why didn't you just say it on that day? And she was afraid to. She, she had that fear that if she said something, it would lead to a fight and maybe I would leave or something. And I finally told her, and you've probably heard me say this before, just tell me even if you think I'll hate you for it. Just tell me even if you think I'll yell at you for it. Just tell me. Don't hold it in because then I go for weeks not knowing where you are and feeling like you don't love me and, and you don't want me here. I just hate that. <laughs> and she's like, well... I don't know if I can do that. I'm like, you're going to have to. I don't know if I said that, but <laughs> I was like, please just tell me, even if you're afraid to. And she goes, well, I'll work on it. And so, you know, a couple months went by and I said something that she took wrong or maybe I said it wrong or maybe I was wrong. I don't know. And she goes, well, I want to tell you something. And I'm like, what? And she goes, now you told me to say something even if you'll hate me for it, I'd be like, oh, okay. And I'm thinking in my head, good, this is, this is perfect. This is what I want. I want full expression. And she told me, and I was like, oh, you're upset about that. Okay. Well, you know, uh, I forget what I said. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for it to come out that way, but uh, she said it. She got over that hurdle. It was very scary for her uh, to express it. And um, we were able to talk it out and it was done in that day. If I hadn't said anything before to say, just say it, I don't care, even if you think I'll hate you when you say it. If I hadn't said that, she may have never chosen to share that, and we would have been going another few weeks with that uh, emotional withdrawal that she was so used to doing. She's, she's done that with every other partner in her life, and I wouldn't let it happen, because I used to do that myself, and I didn't want that in my relationship anymore. And so fortunately now... We do say the hard things. We express what's on our mind and get it out on the table so that the other person has something to work with. So, Mary, what does this have to do with you? What does this have to do with you gaining weight and you're not having sex with each other? I think the very first thing that you need to do is express the hard stuff. Both of you. Your husband may not be able to do it. I don't know. But you need to express what you don't want to express even if you fear him leaving you, him yelling at you. Now, oh, I did say something that I don't want to forget is that um, showing the negative side of you, like what you're upset about, what you're angry about, isn't always beneficial in relationships where there has been former abuse. If you have one partner that is highly sensitive to uh, negativity, to yelling, to screaming, to, to you venting, if your partner is like that, that is an entirely different set of variables that will absolutely affect how you show up in that relationship. It's hard. Being with someone who's been abused is very difficult, especially when they're very sensitive to any type of um, negativity whatsoever. So it does take a special partner to be able to express themselves without sounding or being threatening. It's uh, another episode, another show, another day. But uh, this advice that I'm telling you in this episode isn't for those highly sensitive, previously traumatized, previously abused people that are in your life. Because as soon as you come out and be the authentic you, it could be overwhelming. It could ignite PTSD. It could really throw things into a tizzy. And I don't want that to happen. Again, being the victim of former abuse, former trauma is a different set of variables. So just take my suggestions with uh, care and apply them with care. So let me get back to Mary. Mary, if you've not been expressing yourself and really saying what's on your mind, really asking the hard questions, like when you stopped having sex, did you ask the question, why aren't we having sex anymore? What's the problem? Or 
were your inquiries hidden inside you because you didn't want to know the answer? Or if knowing the answer might lead to a um, divorce? These are the kinds of questions that you need to ask because not knowing is the worst. It's hard to go through a relationship not knowing the why of some things or most things, especially with intimacy. Why aren't we being intimate? When I asked my long-term girlfriend, after two years of not having intimacy, I finally asked her, what's wrong? It took me two years to get to that point. What's wrong? And she would say, nothing. And I said, I know something's wrong because you haven't wanted to touch me in two years. And there's always something going on. There's always a an excuse. You always want to watch TV instead of be intimate. There's always something else that you want to do instead of that. So what's the problem? And she finally told me. She wasn't in love with me anymore. And I was like, what? It was a total shock. It was the answer I didn't want to know. At the same time, I didn't want to keep going on in the relationship like this. I didn't want this rut. I had to get out of the rut. How do you get out of the rut? You start asking the questions you don't want the answers to. You start saying the things that you're afraid to say because they might yell at you or leave you. That's the hardest part about all of this. And this is where I want you to go, Mary. Is just If you haven't done this yet, do that first. Start expressing the hard stuff. Start asking the hard stuff because it, it all has to be on the table so you have something to work with. Now, after that, if you've done that or if you haven't, do that first. After that, what you're doing to yourself, eating out of anger, is not really hurting him. And I think you know this. It's hurting you. So there's some sort of self-sabotage going on there that you believe that by gaining weight, it will cause him to be angry with you, which maybe makes him feel like he's made a mistake to marry you. I don't know. Or he's making a mistake by not initiating sex with you. So he's not going to get any sex. He's not going to get a trophy wife. And you're going to torture your own body in the belief that you're hurting him. When in reality, it all comes back to you. You believing you're hurting him is really just hurting yourself. I think you know this. It was kind of stated in your letter indirectly. But I think this is the wrong direction to go. I mean, it sounds like you already know it's the wrong direction to go. But I think this behavior kind of indicates what I may have already said. Because this behavior, from what I can tell, is very passive aggressive. It's the idea of the part, your partner's supposed to wash the dishes. He or she washes some of the dishes, but doesn't finish the load. So you leave a dirty dish on their side of the bed <laughs> or, or something like that. It's a direct slash indirect way to say, hey, fool, <laughs> why don't you do all the dishes? You said you would. You promised. Instead of directly saying or asking you leave clues, you leave signals. And by you gaining weight and trying to become less attractive or less sexy uh, for him or for other people to see you is a very passive, indirect way to express what's really going on inside of you. And I've seen this a lot. A lot of emotional eating has to do with not being able to express or not expressing what's going on inside of you. I mean, the real stuff, the hard stuff, the stuff you don't want to lay on the table. When you're able to come to that place of expressing yourself and get that out, the emotional eating can typically stop. I'm not saying I have a cure for emotional eating or there might be some other issues involved there. I know there's a lot of people that suffer from this. My ex-wife was one of those people and I never understood it fully until near the end of our relationship when she gained so much weight because of not only the judgments that I put on her, very similar to your relationship, but also how she felt expressing herself with me. She was afraid to express herself around me because I was highly judgmental. Why would she feel safe doing that? So what do you do when you can't express yourself? You try to stuff down the pain. You try to repress what's going on into you, suppress it with food. And when you do that, you know, food causes you to gain weight and that brings up a whole other set of issues for yourself, for your own health, 
for your own attraction in the relationship, for the way you feel about yourself. A lot of issues can stem out of that when you're emotional eating. I'm not saying gaining weight is necessarily a bad thing or an unsexy thing. I'm saying that when you use weight as a tool or a mechanism to send a message like that, that you're really always only hurting yourself and causing the problem to get bigger. The problem itself that you started with gets bigger. Oh, we're not having sex, so and I want to have sex, and I want to be loved, so I'm going to get larger when my husband doesn't want me to get larger. So yes, there's some illogical stuff that goes on there, but emotional eating doesn't typically follow logic. It just You're just doing it to ease the pain or ease the feelings that you're having inside. So I have a feeling, this is why I started off saying, full expression, your authentic self is probably the path for you because you need to find out where your husband is with all the facts, with everything on the table and give him the hard questions. He may say, I don't like the way you look. You're overweight. And then you can ask, I wasn't always overweight and the sex stopped before this happened. So what was going on then? How come we weren't intimate? How come you didn't want me? And maybe you'll get an answer you don't like. I don't know. Maybe it'll have to do with something that he's held on to, a resentment or a secret. I don't know. Things you don't want to know the answer to, unfortunately. But you need to get down to that nitty gritty stuff. Because once that's out and you have something to work with, then your relationship can reach the next stage. I'm not saying that's a promotion, so to speak. It could be a demotion. It could be a breakup, a separation, a divorce. I don't know. But I do know that where you are today in this stagnation has to stop. The only way to stop it is to dig down into some hard truths about what's really going on in your relationship. Believe me, after a 13-year relationship with the last two years without sex, my first long-term relationship, my relationship could have gone on if I never asked the hard questions. So to tell you to ask the hard questions that could lead to the end of your relationship is not easy for me to do because that's what happened to me. But it also could lead to a whole new level of your relationship, getting past this rut. It's going to go one way or the other. It has to because the rut that you're in it isn't working. So it has to go one way or the other. My final suggestion for you is that um, you start doing things to improve yourself for you. You start working on yourself for you. If you know you're a catch, then make yourself the best damn catch there is. Because it may not be your husband that you need to impress. You need to impress yourself. I'm not saying you do it to impress other people or attract other people because I know you still want you and your husband for things to work out and have a great relationship. But you do have to start working on yourself for yourself because it's always best to bring the best version of you into the relationship so that you can say, hey, I tried everything. That's a good feeling when you can say, look, I tried everything. And for example, you're still rejecting me. So I know there's nothing more I can do. So I'm going to move on. Because if, you, if you're rejecting this, because <laughs> you're bringing the best version of yourself, then that's your problem. I know I'm great. You're still great who you are today, no matter what weight you are, no matter how you look. But if you know that you don't like yourself, say 45 pounds overweight, then work on yourself. Improve yourself in that way. Then improve yourself for you, not for him. Because doing anything for him doesn't seem to be working. So you need to start improving yourself for you and asking him the hard stuff, telling him the hard stuff so that you can reach the next level. And it may not be easy. You could go one way or the other. It could be a breakup. It could be a whole new level of closeness, but you have to go one way or the other. Otherwise, you're stuck in the middle with all these emotions that you don't know what to do with. I don't know if this will help you, but I hope it does. Thank you so much for writing and send me an update. I want to hear from you. And thanks for listening to this episode. We'll be right back. Say some thank yous and my final thoughts after this. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank Asha. Go to getoutofthemess.com and she'll connect you with a legal insurance plan that's right for you. You know, it's kind of weird to say legal insurance plan. What is that? <laughs> well, call Asha. Ask her. 678-355-8777. She'll fill you in. And I want to thank the members of the patron program. If you're looking for private episodes, worksheets, or even email coaching, or just want to support the show, join the patron program. Go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And thank you to existing patron members that are helping the show get to the airwaves every week. I appreciate you. And whether you're a patron or not, I want to thank you. If you've purchased a book or a worksheet or used uh, especially the Amazon link on the website, then I appreciate you too. In fact, the Amazon link is the easiest way to give back. So if you've been listening for months or years or centuries, I mean, I can imagine hundreds of years from now, this will probably still be available in digital format somewhere. (laughs) Then I want you to use that Amazon link every time you shop. Your shopping habits are making a difference. So thank you. And finally, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. And I'm going to read you a couple quick segments of an email that I really want to address because this affects all of us, or at least most of us. Uh, I've been through it and many people that I know have been through it. The email says, you know, thank you. I love your show. I've been listening for a couple months now, but um, I've integrated your show into my mental health regimen. So thank you for that. Good to hear. And her question is, how do you tell someone you love that they need help? And uh, the email has a lot of information in it, but I'm just going to read you a couple snippets. Uh, She says, I've been struggling for what seems like my whole life. And there came a low point in my life where seeking help was the only thing to stop a personal downward spiral. So I got it. (laughs) It was the best thing I ever did. Seeking help has improved everything in my life. And as I work on better understanding myself and creating a happier life, I realize how much of the limiting negative traits of both my parents I have ingrained in me. So I continue to work and understand and overcome them. And uh, just a quick reply from me, absolutely. That's the same thing in me. (laughs) That's the same thing for a lot of people listening now is that we start to understand all of these things that need healing in us. And uh, once we figure it out, we want to continue moving in that direction, continuing to heal And like you said, continuing to work to understand and overcome them. So great to hear. She goes on to say, and again, I'm just reading snippets. uh, I have one sister that is struggling. She has always been the black sheep in the family and probably got the brunt of the abuse growing up. Every time I visit her and her family, there's so much anxiety, stress, and negativity. My sister is very condescending to her husband. She will take control of whatever he is doing or saying. And she says, I feel bad for my brother-in-law. He submits to her tirades. He lets her yell and belittle him. He lets her take control. Even if she's wrong, I see his personality shrivel and it's heartbreaking to watch. I don't know how it has impacted their daughter, but she's afraid of most people and is rarely out of the parents' watchful eyes and hands. But in two years, I've rarely seen the daughter laugh. She seems much calmer with her dad which I can tell bothers my sister. So what do I do? I care so much about all of them. Is there anything I can do? I know that every person's path is different and what worked for me won't necessarily work for her, but I think her seeking help would be good. I think she needs to start dealing with her issues so that she doesn't pass them on to her daughter and it doesn't ruin her relationship with her husband. I know it's not my problem to solve, but I just see it gets worse and worse every time I visit. Can I tell her that she should go talk to someone? Any expression for concern up to this point, uh, she has interpreted as judgment. Any offering of help, she has interpreted as a condescending gesture. I'm so afraid of saying anything to her because if it goes badly, she will push away a confidant and she will be left with only her husband that she trusts. I don't think that would be helpful for either of them. Is it worth the risk? What a great question. And um, there's two things I want to address in here. And they both relate to each other. The one thing that I want to address is how you show up in their life. How do you show up in their house? How do you show up for their daughter? For example, I don't necessarily like how my girlfriend's son's father behaves uh, around his son and what my girlfriend's son is picking up 
from his father. I don't like it. Can I do anything about it? No. (laughs) So what can I do? And what can you do? The idea is to show up, and I was just saying this in the last segment, as your best self. You continue working on yourself and you be the best person you can be so that, uh, for example, the daughter, your brother-in-law, and your sister, they can all see you and where you are and what results you're getting in your life and how it makes you feel from the stuff that you're doing for you. They can all witness that and choose to want that or not. And this is the second part of my two-parter here, is that your sister and her husband are making a choice to be with each other. It is an adult choice. The choice may be fueled by dysfunction that you can see, but it's still a choice. Choices are self-empowering. They have to be initiated through a chain of events that leads you to that choice. Just like a chain of events led you to your choice to make improvements and uh, seek healing in your life. They need to make their own choice to seek help if they want it. Because I guarantee you, when you try to offer help to someone who isn't ready for it or doesn't want it, you will only push them away. And you've already said this in your letter. You said any offering of help, she is interpreted as a condescending gesture. And she sees it as judgmental. You've already said this. So you already know offering help or suggesting what they can do to improve their lives is a bad choice because their choice to be with each other is the journey they need to go through. Just like you said, everyone has their own path. But how are they going to reach a self-empowered choice that improves their situation? The most unlikely place to reach self-empowerment is when someone else tries to convince you of what to do. Very unlikely. I mean, if if you were ever a teenager, you understand this concept. Because the first time you heard someone advise you, you need to break up with that person, and you're like, what? I'm not breaking up. You don't know our relationship. You don't know what he or she is like. (laughs) The first time someone tells you to do something that you don't want to do, you just want nothing with that person. You don't want to deal with that person who's telling you what to do. You want to get away from them. You develop rebellious behavior. This is what happens, when, especially when you're an adult. When another adult comes along and says, this is what you should do, it feels condescending. It feels judgmental. And somebody might say, hey, you have no idea what we're going through and the decisions that we're making for us. You, from your perspective, are going to see dysfunction and toxicity for the child. And you're going to see all these bad results. But what if I told you that they need to go through this in order to reach a place of decision that is healthy for them? And that might be the only way to get there is by going through bad experiences. Your brother might need to go through a lot of belittling until he finally stands up and says, I can't take this anymore. But if he is convinced by you that he needs to stand up for himself, He may not be ready to hear that, and it might even push him farther away from that decision. It may not. You might have that much influence. I don't know. But when it comes to the dysfunction that I perceive in other relationships and other people, I rarely give advice unless asked. And this is where I'm leading you to, is that the more you work on yourself, And focus on your own improvements. Focus on your own healing. Focus on your own happiness. And the more you show up like that in their lives, in anyone's life, the more likely someone will eventually say, hey, how do you do it? And that's your opportunity. So I really suggest that you take the opportunity when asked, but not before. Because They're going to see who you are. They're going to see how you're like. And if you show up as any type of person that insists that you have a better answer than them, it will feel belittling to them. So my opinion, 
is to back off, support where they are, where they need to be. You may hate it. You may see things that are terrible. But this is, like you said, and I'm glad you said it, this is their journey. This is their path. So who can you be? You can be that supportive, nurturing, loving listener that you've been with your sister-in-law, with your brother, with that family. And you can watch things unfold. You can hate it if you want inside of yourself. But you keep showing up as, hey, I'm not here to interfere because I love you guys and I want you to be happy no matter what. And I trust that you'll find that path. I'm not saying you say these things. You just, you have this philosophy inside of you. You think it. I trust that your path is the right path that is creating the chain of events that will lead you to self-empowering decisions where you will find happiness. Because you talk about um, the black sheep in your family, like my sister's the black sheep. Believe me, we all have a black sheep. I have two or three, (laughs) maybe two uh, in my family, you know, directly, indirectly, they're all scattered. And um, I want to help them. I want to offer my coaching services for free. (laughs) You know, it's family, but they're not ready. If they were ready, they would seek me out. They would come to me and say, look, I know you do this. I know you can help me. Will you help me? And of course, I'm going to say yes. Of course, I'll help you. But until they're there, anything that I suggest will either be denied, rejected, or even if they pulled it in and said, okay, I'll try it out for a while. It won't stick. It can't stick. They're not there yet. They have to reach that level in themselves in order to get there. And the best way for that to happen is for you to show up as your best self and them see you in the space that you're in and for them to feel like, wow, I want some of that. You know that uh, movie, right? When Harry met Sally, I'll have what she's having. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if you don't know what I mean, uh, just look it up. And uh, But that's the idea. It's like you see someone else and you think, wow, their life is going well. What do you do? How do you do this? I'm happy to share. <laughs> but until then, they're just not ready. And it may be hard for you to stand by and let them not be ready until they're ready. But as long as you keep showing up as that you're always working on yourself, you're always healing, Believe me, the daughter's going to see that too. Their daughter's going to see that. Just like my girlfriend's son, he can look at me and take things that he likes about me and uh, absorb them uh, into his personality, his psyche. So hopefully I'm showing up for him as a positive male role model of some sort. And I'm not saying that his dad is a negative male role model. I just think that there are personality traits that he is picking up from his dad that probably won't benefit him in life. Um, But that's my opinion. So I stay out of it. (laughs) I want him to have the happiest, healthiest life he could possibly have. So what I'm going to do is show up as the best version of myself so he can see what it can be like. And then if he thinks he needs that, he'll come to me. So I try not to push what I believe to be, quote, the answers to anyone. Unless you listen to this show, but of course you're tuning into this (laughs) But I'm hoping that when you tune into this, that you always keep an open mind so that you can step into your own power. It's not all about me telling you what to do. It's about you being firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. I want you to always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something that I absolutely know to be true about you. You are amazing.
Hello, this is... <laughs> uh, <coughs> Let's try that again.